Ok, bonjour à tous. On va, on va pouvoir commencer. Donc on, bah je vais switcher en anglais. Donc on, we are welcoming today, so we are very pleased to welcome today Professor Kumanet, which is um, which is working at uh, so which is professor in global health at the Department of Infectious uh, Disease Epidemiology at the University of uh, the Imperial College in London. And he's a well-known uh, expert in epidemiology and in mathematical modeling, especially in the field of uh, uh, HIV infection and um, var viral antibodies. So um, today he's going to, to present his, uh, his work on the modeling of LBV uh, epidemiology and uh, how to use it to guide health policy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to be here. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk to you about the HBV modelling we've done, um, just briefly around modelling. Then I'm going to canter through a couple of examples of where we've used that model in different applications and show you some key results. Then I'm going to give you a little taste of what we're working on right now in this particular model. Um, some people ask me what role does epidemiological modeling play? And this is my default answer. That it's uh, just a way, really, of stitching together different pieces of data. And it is not a substitute for, um, for collecting data. Some people think, oh, we can you know, just model it. We don't need to observe it. Or you know, modeling is like competing with tr doing trials. That's not the case at all. It's just when you've got data on the prevalence of a pathogen and the cost it takes to treat the pathogen and efficacy of a vaccine that prevents you from getting the pathogen, how do you connect those dots together to say something meaningful about what to do? Well, modeling is meant to be just that connective tissue to enable you to say something helpful which builds on all of those other data sets. So any limitations in those, in those data get propagated up to any modeling results, plus as many assumptions as you're making to stitch them together will also add to the frailty of the model. But it does allow us to answer some interesting questions, like is something worth doing for different definitions of worth? Is something possible to achieve, like, like elimination? Or when will it be achieved? Does it represent good money, good value for money? compared to other uses of those resources. And it's very important too at the bottom here, the modeling is very often used to show when we're doing an intervention, what indicators should we be paying most attention to to know if that's working or not. And they, it can illuminate what we don't know, but which is important to know, which is obviously a good opportunity to do further research. That's my, that's my stall set out now. So here's the little examples I'm gonna, gonna, gonna walk through. I'm gonna talk to you about um, how I got into this area of work, which is on um, setting, helping set targets for elimination of HBV for the WHO and the World Health Assembly. I'm gonna show you how that's, those targets have been applied to China and how, China, how, how the amazing progress that, that the program in China has, uh, has achieved. And then I'm going to, actually, I'm not going to talk very much about HPV in Africa um, today. And I'm going to skip to um, using the modelling to inform the recent guidance around uh, PMTT for HPV, Prevention of Mother Child Transmission for HPV. And then the current directions we're working on at the moment are model comparisons, because it turns out our model doesn't always do the same thing as everyone else's model. And so we've got to work out who's right, who's wrong, or whether we're both right or most likely whether we're both wrong, and how we can improve these models um, to make them use more efficiently the increasing amounts of data there are on HPV natural history and epidemiology. Okay. So you may or may not know that um, HPV is one of the most uh, widely prevalent infectious um, diseases having one of the biggest tolls on mortality of, of any 
infectious disease. Um, 257 million people are living with HPV today, 3.5% of the population, and it's concentrated in Africa and the Western Pacific region. Fortunately, there's a vaccine which can be provided to young infants, um, which is very efficacious and has been being scaled up, as you can see here, um, over the last several decades. The different lines through different regions, and so they had different uh, trajectories over the, over the past, but uh, nowadays coverage is pretty high in, in most places, which is a, a great new story. So the first question we wanted to ask is, given HPV is really prevalent, but given that there's been a massive scale-up of a really efficacious vaccine, how much good has that vaccine already had? So we turn to a model to represent the world as it is today, country by country, intervention by intervention, and then we extracted from the model the role of the vaccine. And so we can produce two scenarios now. The actual scenario actually happened, we think, which is the blue line, and the dash line, which is what we think didn't happen, the counterfactual, which is without the, the vaccine. And you can see that the, uh, the vaccine's already had an, an enormous impact. Probably um, uh, has already reduced the number of new infections down by about 80% on what it would have been had there been no vaccine scale-up. But interestingly, you wouldn't expect yet to be seeing this in, in prevalence. The prevalence hasn't changed very much yet, and that's because people um, who are infected with HPV live with HPV for a very long time. So we've turned off sort of the tap of people entering the bathtub of, of, uh, of infections, but because that bathtub is not very leaky, that bathtub is still high. I hope you understand what I mean by bathtubs and taps. It's a common way that uh, I teach the incident and prevalence uh, link. Um, Gavi is this uh, agency, non-governmental organisation, which collects money from donor governments and private philanthropy and has funded a lot of the vaccine scale-up, particularly in Africa. And they commissioned... Uh, our group to look at the impact of their vaccine portfolio and uh, this, these are the results here compared and it, for HBV is just, just one of uh, the vaccines that they fund amongst all the others but they were amazed to learn that actually about fully one third of their impact of all of their portfolio is coming from what they're doing in, in Hep B. And that's because a lot of these other pathogens are either not so common or not so lethal. So this, this slide was, uh, was used to argue for continuing and increasing the funding of um, Hep B vaccine in the Gavi portfolio. And a related analysis was used to help argue the board, help argue to the board that um, the birth dose should also be funded in future rounds of, of Gavi programs should the current punishment be successful. So having convinced ourselves of the huge impact of the vaccines using the modelling, we then set to think about, well, what if we layered on more interventions? How much more impact could we have? So this graph on the top is showing the incidence of new chronic carriage of HPV, like incidence, and this is the deaths due to HPV. Um, the blue line is what's happening right now. The red line is if we scaled up infant vaccination. And this purple line is if we were to do a massive scale-up of birth dose and other things that can help prevent mother-to-child transmission. I'll go into it more later, but there's more things you can do to help prevent mother-to-child transmission than, than just, the, just the vaccine. And you see that that creates a big impact in the number of new infections, which means that in the future, we can expect the new incidence rate to come very, very low. It allows us to talk about the epidemic having been practically eliminated. So clearly, any WHO international target is going to want to put a heavy emphasis on scaling up infant vaccination and scaling up other things that are going to help prevent mother-child transmission. But what's also quite sad about that is that uh, this, this deaths graph, 
because you could do all these interventions to prevent new infections, but nothing actually reduces deaths so far. So it means that we can have all the success we want in reducing new infections, but we can't help but see an increase year on year for the next two decades in the number of people who are going to die from HPV. And that's because of all the people who are currently have HPV about which we're not doing anything for. So that's why the other half of targets, we think, have to include a scale up of, of treatment. Treatment does nothing very much for prevention, but does help prevent that surge in deaths that would otherwise, ha otherwise happen. So these two components, equally important. Well, we can talk about how you define important, but two things to think about. And it was that insight which led to these WHO targets for the world, which said, what you need to do is uh, do these interventions at these levels of coverage. And if you do, our model said that you will get these kinds of impacts. You get a 90% reduction in new infections of B and C, and a 65% reduction in, in deaths. Um, so that is using the modeling for a what-if analysis. It says, if these targets can be achieved, this will be the impact. Or conversely, if you want to have that kind of impact on the epidemic, if you really want to eliminate the epidemic, this is what you need to do. So it's useful for advocacy, and it's useful for sort of benchmarking what, what needs to happen and the scale of the ambition. But some people mistake this for a prediction. It's not my prediction what will happen. When, I, when we first released these, I used to walk around the offices of WHO in Geneva, people would stop me in the, in the corridor, and they'd go, you're mad. You, what, let me tell you about what's happening in this country, and there's no way it's going to be achieved. And that's not the purpose of the modeling. It's not a prediction of saying what's happening. It's saying, if you, could, if you could achieve this, this will be the impact that happens. And it's up to the individual programs in every country to work out the strategies, the tactics, the ground game by which those targets might, might one day be achieved. i now move to uh, an example which is China. Because it's one thing using a model to create targets at an international level where things are a bit esoteric and, and hypothetical. But working with a country <coughs> that has a real program and has real money to think about is a different consideration. So China, as you, you may or may not know, has been an incredible success story in, uh, in HPV world. They uh, scaled up the vaccine hard and fast. They've scaled up uh, birth dose and HPV hard and fast. And uh, this graph is hard to read, even for me, and I look at it all the time. <laughs> but essentially, believe me when I say <laughs> it's telling you that prevalence has gone down to sort of ridiculously low levels, thanks to all of these uh, uh, prevention interventions that have been, been scaled up. So the people in China said, OK, well, we want to eliminate HPV. In fact, we want to be one of the first countries to say we've eliminated HPV. And we think we're in a good position to say that because we've done such an amazing job with our program, look at this complicated graph. Are, are we doing enough? So we said, uh, okay, well, we'll, we'll put this in the model and we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. And so this is our, so they defined elimination as a prevalence of uh, service antigen of HPV, prevalence of HPV, among one to four year old children being less than 0.1% uh, overall. And so we ran, the, we ran the model, and we said, OK, yeah. Well, actually, it looks like you're going to get below that by about 2026, 2027, which is incredible. And it's because they have 99% coverage of, of all the key interventions. But they said, OK, well, how would we bring that sooner? And we said, what? And they said, yes. <laughs> and we said... OK, <laughs> how about 99.9% <laughs> coverages? So this, this is my own complicated graph, to sort of as my revenge for their complicated graph. And what it's saying is 
um, what, I'm, what I'm mapping here is imagine you could measure the transmission rate between mothers and children in this country. And you could see if it was 1% of infected mothers were giving rise to infections among their children, or 2%, or 3%, or whatever it was. And imagine you were measuring that in, in different years. So you measure it in 2019, and you want to know, well, if it's this value, when will there be elimination? Or if I measure it in 2023, and it's this value, when will be elimination? That's what this graph is showing, and the colours show you the years that elimination will be achieved by. And then the triangles on here are sort of mapping what interventions might correspond to these levels of mother-to-child transmission. And so there, uh, there's, some, there's somewhere here. So if they, in 2020, measured mother-to-child transmission rate, and it was around 2%, so 2% of mothers with surface antigen were leading to infected children, then we could say, all oh, right, well, you're on course to eliminate by 2025. But if you were to have an intervention which scaled up each big coverage to 99.9% and also had some tenofovir, which is an antiretroviral, also given to the um, antigen positive mothers, or then elimination could be brought forward to 2023. So that's an example of how the modelling is being used to help set targets and um, help relate targets and ambitions that come from a sort of political sphere into sort of what, what programmes we need to do to, to achieve it. Um, and I think the you know, debate still, still goes on about what will actually happen. There's also some, uh, uh, at, least from, at least in my mind, some uncertainty about whether all the data sets completely agree with one another about how high coverage of interventions really are. I think there are some provinces where it's uh, much lower than national averages. Anyway, that's the prevention side. So the treatment side, because uh, in doing this work, we were really keen to, uh, to not just focus on prevention, but to focus on the other side of the equation, which is the treatment as well. And we knew that treatment was very expensive. In fact, at the time we did this work, um, there wasn't um, the, without going into the details of it because I don't really know the details but certain things are refundable on insurance, national insurance in China and some things aren't and at this time the drugs that you would need for treatment of HPV were not included in the insurance so essentially no one was on treatment because of that but we saw a data suggesting that people that were having very serious advanced disease of HPV, cirrhosis and cancer, were coming into the health system with lots of difficult, complicated, costly to treat and manage conditions. So it was costing the hospital something to look after them. It was also incurring quite a lot of out-of-pocket expenses for the patients themselves. They were having to buy over-the-counter privately remedies that weren't very effective or efficacious. They were having to travel. They were having to take time off work. There was a huge drag on the private and public economy through there not being the treatment. Meanwhile, the treatment, which is tenofovir, which is the main drug at that time used to treat HIV, had a very, very low cost. So we wondered whether, in fact, treating people would be cheaper than not treating people, as well as having the enormous life-saving benefits of, of the drug itself. So this is our sort of uh, simplistic representation of how, what, what's driving costs each year to do with HPV. And you can see this big uh, orange section is all of the costs that we, in, we thought were to do with caring for people with HPV who were, who were going to die, probably, uh, before they died. The yellow is the cost of death from a human capital approach where you say that someone who dies, um, you know, uh, the, the economy loses the opportunity to benefit from that person's productivity. And uh, here's, the, here's the treatment cost. And 
for a little squirt of treatment cost, that green section, you're able to get avoid quite a lot of the, the care costs. So this is a ridiculous diagram which shows uh, many, many uncertainty runs trying to sort of triangulate all of this information. But essentially, the weight of this graph, most of the lines are on the negative axis, which is sort of confirming my hypothesis that actually the providing of treatment at a reasonable price, when it is defraying the cost of treating, caring people who didn't get treatment, actually saves money. And I haven't got all the graphs. Oh no, I do have all the graphs. I do have all the graphs. So I won't save money. Depends on two things both of which are quite uncertain. And so when things are uncertain, we tend to draw these kind of diagrams that illustrate how this uncertainty maps onto that decision problem. Depends on how costly treatment is and how costly it is to care for someone who hasn't been treated and is about to die of HP-related causes. So here's the treatment cost scaler getting cheaper and more expensive. One is our default value, just scale to one. And this is the care costs. One is our default value. Cheaper to care for someone down here. More expensive. This is actually quite fun. More expensive to... Uh, <laughs> more expensive to treat someone, uh, care for someone up there. The white, the white line <coughs> is the isocline for break-even. So if, if actually treatment costs loads, and caring for someone is quite cheap, well then we're going to be down here in the red zone where treatment is, more, is expensive and it's not going to be cost effective, there's going to be no positive return on investment. But if we're up there in the blue space, on the upper, that side of the white line, well then it is going to be a positive return on investment. And you can see that our default estimate is just, you know, near the ice decline. So you know, it doesn't, doesn't give us a great deal of confidence to say it'll definitely be the case you're going to save money if you treat people rather than, than don't treat them people. But this graph does give people the opportunity to say, OK, well, if we're going to do this, we need to make a really clear case about how much it costs to care for people. We better collect those data. We better work out precisely, not with this uncertainty, but precisely how much it costs to care for someone coming in with late stage cirrhosis or liver cancer. So we know where we are on this axis. But it also gives people um, negotiating for the costs of treatment to know what trigger points for costs would be the right ones where you can make the argument of it being cost saving. So where we are on this axis. Um, I'll shortcut the story and say that after doing this, those studies were done, those negotiations were happened, and it became more and more clear that the right answer was sort of like further into the blue zone. And then a policy was changed such that um, these drugs became refundable on the national insurance uh, scheme. Only recently that happened. Um, and so I'm hoping that that's led to a, a scale up of of treatment. This is um, a difficult graph to explain, but it's showing, and I'm not an economist actually, so maybe you all understand this better than me, <laughs> but uh, it's saying how uh, when something becomes refundable under insurance, how that is good for some people, balance, balance, bank balances, and bad for others. So patients who have been paying a lot of this directly suddenly have less to pay, which is good. Um, society has less to pay as well, because they're getting more productivity from people who are not dying. But the government and the sort of insurance body uh, has, a, has more to pay, and there are different ways of adding those up together and weighting them, and it's not my decision about how you weight them together, it's obviously government <coughs> China's uh, Decision, but that, that's. But when I'm saying it's overall cost saving, what I'm saying is when I add together those four components, weighted in a particular way, that's what's cost saving. Okay, that's the story of China.
now I'm going to tell you about the story, the recent story, of um, using this model to inform guidelines in the WHO around the prevention of mother-to-child transmission. This, this, this work is very hot off the press. It was only, we only finished it off on, for the 9th of September. So uh, if you spot any errors, don't, don't tell me, because it's too late. <laughs> no, do tell me. The question here was the WHO wanted to... Uh, well they, they, their question was, how can we really make sure that we're doing everything we can to prevent a mother who's infected with HPV from passing it on to her baby. For lots of reasons I haven't gone into, we think that's the dominant route of transmission now. And while we've got the birth dose, that, that we're definitely going to do that, that's really helpful, it's not perfect. It's far from perfect, in fact, for women that have a particular serological status of having E-positivity and or having a high viral load. So we're looking for, looking for something else. And this treatment Peri, you know, peri tenofovir, peripartum treatment, probably is going to suppress the woman's viral load and make her much less likely to transmit to her baby. Very similar to the HIV situation, if you know about the HIV situation. But the question becomes, well, who do we give this treatment to? Should we give it to nobody? Which is option one. Uh, and two. <laughs> Or should we give it to people according to those who have the highest viral loads? Because we think viral load is the thing which really predicts transmission. So if you get a high viral load, we'll be smothering most of the transmission. But has the downside that a viral load test is quite expensive and difficult to do, isn't point of care, blood's going to be sent off somewhere and come back, bit of a pain. Or do we let that PPT peripartum treatment be given to people who have, women who have, positivity for E antigen, which has the advantage that we can do E antigen testing, point of care, at the clinic, nice and easy, um, old technology, cheap. But the disadvantage that we don't know quite how well E antigen positivity predicts someone who's going to be very, very high li likely to transmit to their baby. has good correlation, but not perfect. So that's the trade-off. So here's our, here's our graphs again. <laughs> um, and now I've, I've, we did this for all over the world. Here are the graphs of West Africa. Blue is getting get vaccination. Red is the, the birth dose. And these two lines sort of knotted together are the strategies where we're providing pay part and treatment according to E antigen or viral load. Things to note here are that, you know, what's doing all the work in the vaccination is doing a lot of the work in reducing incidence. Then birth dose, imperfect though it is, still does a lot of work to reduce transmission. And then these things, these peripartum treatments, it's relatively small impact compared to the other things, but also they're quite close together. It's not seeming to make very much difference whether you do one or the other, which is a bit surprising. Um, these are now looking at ISIS, the expected costs per DALI averted, where DALI is the measure of health that you get from such an intervention. And uh, what we see is that for either the uh, peripartum treatment guided by viral load or by HPA AAG. We have a lot of uncertainty, but the baseline estimates are actually quite low. So even though it's not producing an enormous impact at the sort of population level, it still might be a good use of resources. It still might be generating more health through spending your money on peripartum treatment than you would get for other things that you could spend your money on. And we, and we look at that by looking at the uh, Estimates of health opportunity cost each of those countries. To understand more about what's driving that result, we looked at these, uh, these, these cost drivers. So these are the strategies for the peripartum treatments, three and four. We see that a lot of the big chunk of cost is due to vaccination, another big chunk of cost due to uh, the birth dose, 
And only a relatively small cost is coming from this whole PPT strategy. In fact, the yellow line, the uh, peripartum, the treatment itself, is the smaller section. The drugs themselves are quite cheap. And it's the diagnostic and the, and the screening in the purple and green and turquoise sections, which are bigger. So this whole screening malarkey is actually more expensive than the treatment itself in, in large part. So our conclusion ended up being that, well, what should we do? Peripartum treatment by e-antigen e or by viral load? Our answer was, well, it depends more than anything, actually, on the cost at which you can procure and deliver that screening using viral load or screening using e-antigen. If viral load costs are high, which I think they're going to be in most settings, then an HBAG, HB, EAG strategy is likely to dominate. But if e-antigen costs are high, then a viral load strategy um, is dominant. So we did a lot of work for the WHO. And then I got to this graph and I thought, I probably could have done that graph <laughs> before all the work. It sort of makes sense, doesn't it? Nothing, but both could be cost effective. The one which is cheaper is likely to be most cost effective. So that's a little example of the kind of work we're doing <coughs> using this model over the past couple of years. And I'll talk about what we're doing right now, what's occupying us right now. One is model comparisons. So I mentioned that when we did that work for Gavi to estimate the impact of Hep B in their whole, whole portfolio, they have two models doing every calculation for every pathogen. Because for something so important, you kind of want to be sure that different independent groups are saying the same thing, as opposed to you're being led one way or the other by particular assumptions of one particular model. So these model comparisons are becoming more and more common. And the, sort of the other really important main model is the model done by the Center for Disease Analysis, uh, Homi Razavi's group in uh, Boulder, Colorado. And they, their model is called, what's it called? It's called Pro Progress. It's called Progress. And it has this sort of like, some letters of capitals, some are small. And the reason for that is very important, but I've got no idea what it is. <laughs> but <laughs> but you, have, you have to do it, otherwise they get offended. So, th and, uh, so, th th so what we did, we said for one particular country, India, let's compare our results over three scenarios. Three scenarios are the common ones. Things stay the same. We scale up vaccination and we scale up birth dose vaccination, the other thing which can help prevent mother to child transmission. And we look at the number of cases over time in this very, very long time horizon. Uh, and imperial is dotted lines. Progress is uh, solid lines. And so you, so you look at this, and first of all, you go, well, pr pretty, pretty impressively, at first blush, despite them using separate data, separate assumptions, working 6,000 miles apart, never talking to one another, this looks pretty similar. They start at the same level, and they end up at the same level, and the ordering of the colors is sort of similar. So one part of me thinks, great. We agree. But the other part of me is nagging because, you know, our blue and red lines are very close together, suggesting a small impact of scaling in vaccination. And that, but our green line is far apart from them, suggesting a big impact of birth dose. Whereas for CD progress, all their lines are close, close together. So this is going to make a difference because when I go out to India, I'm going to say, my goodness, you've got to scale up birth dose. But when they go up to India, they're going to say, oh, vaccination is going to lead to elimination around the same time. So I was really interested to understand what it is that's causing these differences. We did a lot of um, sort of diagnostics and diving into the modeling, comparing code. And what we think came up to be sort of the smoking gun, the thing which was different and, you know, really uh, at the center of things, was how much transmission each model thinks is coming perinatally. So Imperial thinks that there's quite a lot of perinatal infection in India, 
and in progress model thinks there's less prenatal infection in India. We've got no data <laughs> on how much transmission actually happened prenatally in India, so we don't know who's right. But we can look in the models to see what assumptions are causing these differences. <coughs> and it comes, and we think it was due to um, the imperial model had a higher level of perinatal transmission. The imperial model only allowed horizontal transmission to occur in infants over one years old, and the imperial model had an assumption that birth dose was more efficacious. So as an experiment, we tried to change the assumptions in the imperial model to see what would happen. So we changed the imperial model such that it had a lower risk of perinatal transmission, had a lower uh, allowed horizontal transmission to occur to infants at younger ages and we assumed a smaller effect size of birth dose. We ran the model and we, this is now infection diverted uh, in India and the imperial model was blue, progress originally was red and the imperial model where we change the three assumptions becomes black. So those three little changes bring the models closer together. That's a relief. At least I now understand why the models are saying different things uh, in India. But they still don't tell me which one's right. And so this is another way in which modelling can help us point to uh, sources of research for epidemiology. Because it, it, it's reason both of our assumptions are reasonable. Both of our assumptions are prima facie consistent with the data. Both of the assumptions have sort of been reviewed by country level epidemiological experts and are agreed to be okay. But unfortunately, that provides latitude for two different models to say quite different things. So if we had better data on any of these three things, it would allow us to say more definitively which um, set of predictions are important. So these model comparisons are a way of showing how assumptions propagate the differences in impact, even uh, around things that one group or other might not think themselves is very important. And so the last thing I want to talk about is uh, learning HPV natural history from data. <coughs> so when I started working in this, uh, this field, we sat down uh, read loads of things about hepatitis and created a sort of a model structure about how things work. You know, you get infected, you have acute infection, you have an uh, immune tolerant phase, a reactive phase, you progress to cirrhosis and cancer. And then for, uh, I wanted to know what the death rate was from each box. I wanted to know how people progress from one box to the other. And my colleague who I've done all this with, Shivanti Neogam, I said, Shivanti, go and, go and find these numbers. And so she did reviews of literature for every single one. But the literature is dominated <coughs> from studies in Asia. And so the results you get tend to be quite Asian-y. Doing literature review for each different part of natural history means that you can get you know, really good, robust cohort data around one parameter. But you can't really get data on some other parameter. So we're not sure how to balance these things together. Plus, when we're trying to sort of fit the model, there is lots of um, rules of thumb and heuristics that clinicians are used to saying, oh, approximately half our patients have cirrhosis and half patients have cancer. But these things tend to come with a sort of hidden confounding that they're based on who's coming into the clinic as opposed to who in the population uh, has HBV. So all of this has been done, and same for all other models, um, in a slightly ad hoc way. But over the time we've been doing this, more and more data has been arising in Africa. And more of the questions that we have are about West Africa and Africa generally. So we said, okay, let's do this the way that you know we'd like to do, which is let's survey all papers that have ever been published around epidemiology or natural history or treatment or vaccination impact in the world. Let's work out where those are. 
Then let's now subset those and look at all of the results for Africa. And subset those and look at all the results for West Africa. And subset those and look at all of the effects for Gambia. Then for all of the papers, let's extract the raw data from those papers and where possible get the individual patient per row data sets. Now we've got this enormous data set for Gambia, West Africa, Africa and the world. Let's now fit the model directly to all those data. Doing that allows us to explicitly code that if a data point comes from Gambia, really listen to it. If a data point comes from West Africa, sort of listen to it. If it comes from other parts of Africa, well, you know, be guided by it. And if it comes from Asia, pff, don't listen to it very much at all unless there's something, unless there's uh, nothing else available. So it allows us to put a hierarchy of evidence. It also allows us to sort of resolve where there are tensions. Because sometimes when you're fitting a model, you find that it's very easy to fit either these data or those data, but not both. They somehow are inconsistent with one another. So fitting to a model to all digit ones allows us to reveal where that's the case and to work out why it's the case by looking at study designs and so on. It also allows us to propagate the uncertainty because around some parts of the model, there's loads of data and we know that parameter precisely. But for other parts of the model, there's hardly any data and so we don't know it very well at all. So when we run the model, we want to run the model which, in a way which represents that uncertainty. So some things around vaccination and the impact on incidence we'll know very well, but other things about the impact on deaths we'll know less well because we don't know very much about um, progression rates to cirrhosis, for example. So we fitted this model in this completely different way to how models are normally done. And uh, this is work of my uh, student, <coughs> N Nora. Um, so I can't, that, that's all I've got to say about it. Here is the, the result of three years of her work and 10,000 hours on the computer fitting uh, this model. So each point is a point that's been painstakingly extracted from a data set or a, a, or a paper. You know, so for instance, at prevalence of HPEAG by age. Got loads of data, got to, got to fit to it. This is chronic infection. You know, just, just, she's got hundreds of graphs, just giving you a, a subset. This is by age, for HPEAG 1982. This is something to do with proportion ever infected from papers back to 1995, 1998 by age. This is the uh, rate of getting liver cancer by age. This is a survival diagram of mortality for patients who've got HCC. This is the risk of chronic carriage by age. All these different facets of the model put in together. And what you're, what you're meant to take from this graph is that lots of data, loads more graphs that I'm not showing, but it's quite noisy. It's quite hard for one model to thread its way through it. But through lots of fitting and stuff, we have found an ensemble of models, a set of models, a range of projections which do broadly become consistent all the data sets. So this gives us a really good foundation, I think, to do the next generation of work of uh, to policy questions around HPV in uh, West Africa. So let me summarise by saying that uh, I think there has been promising progress on the road to elimination of HPV, but there is heterogeneity between regions. Um, do you know what? These actually aren't my conclusions. This is a conclusion from a different talk. My real conclusions <laughs> are, <laughs> are that modelling is really great <laughs> um, and you should work with me. No, the the modelling is really useful for all these different ways, but really flawed as well by not having availability of data and creating lots of uncertainty as well as helping you helping guide guide things. There is a role for it in policy. Its biggest role for me is not answering questions, but providing questions. Modeling doesn't say the answer is X. Modeling says if you want to know the answer, you better find out Y. Um, but it's also a really exciting time to be working on HPV. 
enormous progress has already be happened, but I think we're about to enter a phase where we're going to see treatment coverage coming up, death rates coming down, and more and more countries reaching elimination targets. So I think it's a really exciting time to be in this area. Those are my, those are my real conclusions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs>